I'm going to talk today about um, about the human microbiome, but I usually like to set the stage a little bit more more generally. So I think when we think about uh, health and disease, we we you know we each carve off different aspects of the things that we focus on, which makes a lot of sense because we have to focus on something as opposed to taking this holistic view. Um, and so I'm sure there's lots of people in the room that would be really interested in the host genetics and how that relates to disease. Uh, so if we're looking at this uh, this baby, you know, we'd be able to possibly predict some diseases, some chronic disease, some rare inherited diseases, all from all from their genome. Um, and then on the other side of the course is the nature versus nurture argument, right? So how much is the environment contributing to to their health outcomes or their chances of developing certain diseases in the future? And um, microbes traditionally was probably more in that nurture environment aspect, right? We think about them often as pathogens uh, and things that we try to clean and they're not inherently part of us. Uh, and so that's the way that we've viewed and studied microbes for uh, the past hundred years. Um, but I think what we're going to try to move towards now is that microbes is this other thing and maybe it's a part of us and maybe it's another hidden organ sometimes is the term used, or a second genome. Um, but I think it's a separate entity that can be studied and is, is not really environment, it's not really host, but it, it's, it's part, of the, part, part of the puzzle. And so I'm really interested in sort of how these things play together uh, in different aspects. Uh, and so today I'm going to try to sort of tease apart mostly about the microbes and how that affects Crohn's disease uh, some, and some other disease, but also how that may play with host genetics and which one has a bigger role, uh, say, in Crohn's disease. So what is a microbiome? So uh, the first person to really coin the term is John Lips in 1988. And surprisingly, most terms over time really changes and morphs into something that isn't what the initial person meant. But in this rare case, um, it's actually still pretty much holds true. So I'm not going to reread this except for the last part, but thus that just that the term thus not only refers to the microorganisms involved, but also encompasses their theater of activity. And so when we're talking about a microbiome, we sometimes talk about a, a place. So you can talk about my tongue microbiome or my eyelid microbiome. Um, but we're really talking about the microbes that are living there and the, sort of their functions and activities. So that includes their genes and obviously their transcripts and metabolites that they're, that they're making. Um, and so the human microbiome is basically the entire community of microbes that live on the body. Um, people like to f throw fun facts about how many human cells there are compared to uh, bacterial cells, and the most <coughs> closest estimates are maybe it's one to one, but it really depends on when you last had your last uh, bowel movement. <laughs> We're going to get really graphic really quickly here, right? No, and then, uh, but what's uh, the other important factor is basically the fact that. Uh, bacterial genomes or microbial genomes encode a lot of different functions, way outnumbering our own genome, uh, almost 10 or 100 to 1. Uh, and then most importantly is although we'll be talking mostly about bacteria uh, and archaea, uh, the microbiome also encompasses other microbes, so microbial eukaryotics, and those could be uh, parasites, uh, but it also includes viruses, and I'm not going to talk about them today, but there's uh, some virus uh, in the lab looking at the human biome that we can talk about later. And of course, the reason why we study the human microbiome is because obviously we're interested in how that interplays with disease. Uh, and I'm sure uh, even if you don't study the microbiome, you may have been exposed uh, to different studies that have come out uh, associating the human microbiome with different diseases. And so those really started with the human microbiome, looking at papers, uh, looking at experiments in mice, and then those have uh, <coughs> made their way into humans as well. And some of those are quite causal, where you can actually show that in, uh, an obese, uh, microbiome phenotype can be transferred from uh, an obese person right to a mouse, uh, and that's independent of diet. And so those studies have then uh, obviously gone into other areas which make a lot of sense, like inflammatory bowel disease, where there's this tight-knit community between inflammation that's happening uh, in, in the intestine and, and how the microbes interact with that. Uh, and then it's spread into other areas like cancer, so colorectal cancer again being uh, fairly close to where most microbes live but also other types of cancer, including breast cancer now, uh, and prostate cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Uh, and then besides that, other diseases that are related to sort of um, more systemic effects, so atherosclerosis, there's been uh, a couple of nice papers describing how the microbes uh, make basically precursors that lead to, uh, that convert phosphatidylcholine into TMAO, which is then uh, leading to possible heart disease down the road. 
uh, and then more systemic things like arthritis and uh, cirrhosis, uh, sorry, sorry, psoriasis and cirrhosis actually, um, that are sort of autoimmune regulation from the microbiome side. And I'm not going to touch at all the sort of gut brain axes, but there's some interesting studies about how the microbiome might be interacting with actual development and behavior. And those are mostly coming from mice where you can look at germ free mice or mice treated with antibiotics and actually change their behavior. But there is starting to be some nice uh, studies now, uh, especially on autism uh, and the microbiome. And I guess from a general point of view, what's kind of nice about the microbiome is, and also that makes it hard, is that it's, it's, it's manipulable, it's changeable. Uh, so one of the most common questions they usually get is, you know, how much does it change day to day? And it, it changes quite a bit, especially depending on what you've eaten primarily. So if you went, say, in Halifax, where I'm from, and you went for a couple beers and maybe a doner or poutine, the next day, likely your microbiome has changed. But the thing is that you'll actually be able to differentiate yourself from someone else, uh, someone else's microbiome. So it's fairly consistent from that side. But obviously your host genetics play a role in that. Uh, diet, environmental exposures, where you live, uh, and the drugs that you take all interact with the microbiome. And so that's nice from a theoretically uh, treatable standpoint because if we can manipulate the microbiome and it's causal, uh, then it's something that we can change maybe much easier than our own human genome. Okay, so how do we study the microbiome? Um, so I didn't find a picture, actually I didn't even look for one with Trump looking through a microscope, but it, just, it does not exist. Or I, could, I guess I could make one, it'd be fun. But uh, this is when uh, Obama announced the NIH uh, initiative for the Human Microbiome Initiative. Um, but the way we study, just to really get everyone on the same page here, is that traditional microbiology is basically looking at what we could culture, right? So we take a sample, if we're interested in stool, or if we're interested in ocean, or we're interested in soil, we would take a sample, culture what we could out of it, which turns out to be, you know, a vast minority of all the microbes that exist. So the Great Plate Anomaly says that maybe it's 99% of the things we can't actually culture. Realistically, that number is probably closer to 90% or 8%, depending on how hard you try. Uh, and then we study a single species, or maybe a few species, and we understand that genome, and we understand the phenotype of that genome, and, uh, and that's how we move along for quite a while, and that's how we study pathogens, and we have a lot of knowledge from that. And microbiomics, I guess, is basically the more e ecological approach, where all of a sudden we get to skip this culturing stuff, so we don't have to worry about all the things we can't culture, and we get to analyze them directly. And we analyze them by using sometimes ecology terms because we're looking at all the microbes at once. So to do this, um, I'm going to describe sort of the methods that we use, and it comes back to the actual the research once I touch into it a bit, uh, and about you know the different ways to profile a microbiome. So uh, the most common approach is uh, 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. So this approach, basically you're just using a, a targeted PCR product uh, that's present in, uh, in all bacteria and archaea and all life, which is called 18S and S. Um, and in this approach, we're basically sequencing this one marker over and over again, and then uh, assigning taxonomy or grouping them into species uh, from those sequences. The nice thing about this is it's really well established. It's been used. Uh, the, the longest of any other method. It's relatively cheap because you don't have to actually sequence a ton. So we tend to sequence about 50,000 sequences per sample. Um, in my lab, we do that for about $20 per sample. Um, and the other convenient thing is that it only amplifies sort of what you want. So uh, if you're studying humans with, say, skin or some sort of inflammation with a lot of human cells, you're not going to get uh, sequences back on that side of it. You're going to mostly just get the things that you're targeting. And then the other broad approach is, is what's called shock genomics. And so that's just where we're sequencing all the DNA in the sample. Uh, and so the nice thing about that is we don't have to worry about primer bias, where we might be only amplifying certain bacteria more than others, even though they're supposedly universal. Um, and then also that we can identify all microbes, not just bacteria or archaea that we're targeting, but viruses, eukaryotics, anything that's in the sample. Um, and then the biggest other thing is that you get information not just about what tax are there, but also what functions those are doing. So what, are, what genes are there and, and function, what are those things doing? Um, and you can also sometimes reconstruct genomes or microbial genomes directly from these metagenomes. And then I'm not going to talk at all today, but just saying that they're out there is obviously that we're not focusing on transcriptomics at this point, so we're only looking at DNA. Uh, although people do do metatranscriptomics, and those have obviously the advantages of RNA or DNA that you all know about. 
uh, and then also that you'd be profiling only in theory living cells uh, and temporally how they're changing. So, um, and then the other side is obviously what the bacteria are producing. So meta, it's metatranscriptomics, uh, metaproteomics, and metabolomics as well. Okay, so I'm going to give a quick real plug for the IMR, which was mentioned earlier. Um, so it's just a sequencing resource that's run out of my lab. Uh, and then since 2015, basically we've done a huge number of samples, 34,000 samples in the lab across uh, 122 PIs and 421 scientific projects. Um, obviously there's lots of people that do microbiome sequencing, and so uh, it's kind of nice that we're able to do this in my lab, since we can try different things out, uh, and sometimes we get to look at it some of the more technical sides, which I won't go into today. And I should mention that obviously I'll be talking about human microbiome today, but there's lots of microbiomes out there, and so these are some of the samples that we process, ranging in, obviously, ocean is one of our specialties at Dalhousie, so we process a lot of those samples. Uh, but lots of different host-associated environments, uh, food environments, basically there's always some random weird sample coming into the lab, which is a lot of fun. So this is spun out into at least one one productive uh, paper where we describe basically a set of tools and standard operating protocols um, for microbiome research. Uh, so we rolled that into what's called microbiome helper, mostly for our own in-house training, I would say, but uh, we find it useful for, for running workshops and also for, uh, for others around. So basically it just includes scripts, tutorials, um, a virtual box to sort of help people. So if you're starting with microbiome research, uh, you're going to give it a a look, um, and then we sort of keep adding to that as we test new tools that are continuously coming out. So we had this paper we just put into preprint, where we're trying to compare three major methods that are attempting to correct 16S sequences. So really briefly, 16S sequences you'll get sequencing errors, and to get around that, use collapse them at 97% identity into what's called operational taxonomic units. Uh, and now these denoising methods have come out basically to try to correct for that error by collapsing sequences at 100%. Um, so this paper is just looking at you know which one of those perform the best. Uh, short answer is they're all about the same. <laughs> it's not really exciting. Uh, some of them are faster than others. Uh, some of them are a little more sensitive. Um, and then lastly, before I get into sort of real research, I guess, is if you're starting to get into microbiome research, uh, if either as a trainee or as a supervisor, uh, the Canadian Biofax workshop is giving a uh, workshop this summer. It's going to be here in Toronto. We've done three before in different cities besides Toronto. Uh, so I'll be teaching as well as some of the great faculty uh, as well. So I believe the early bird is not up yet, so uh, spread the word. Okay, so that's my introduction, I guess. Uh, and then uh, a lot of people ask me what I've worked on, and Unfortunately, I don't work on one thing, which is not always easy to describe. So these are existing projects that are sort of in different stages. Some are published and some aren't. Uh, as you can see, they range in diseases and also still doing some soil blueberry stuff, which I can't seem to just part with, but it keeps happening even when I'm in the Department of Pharmacology. They just look a bit weird. <coughs> um, so I'm going to talk mostly uh, about uh, Crohn's disease, uh, PyCrust 2, machine learning, and just taxa versus function. But if anything, uh, sparks your fancy, we can discuss it over uh, uh, after over a beer afterwards. Okay, so I'm going to discuss PyCrest because really it's my claim to fame, I guess, um, because one, it's been widely used, and so it's what people know me as, and PyCrest 2 is hopefully getting submitted uh, this, this, this summer. Okay, so the idea here uh, with PyCrest is, is that, uh, to set it up, is that at some point we have what I mentioned before, 16S sequencing. Uh, you have this who is there question, I'm going to skip over all the important bioinformatics that happens in this step to finally get to this table essentially of counts of different, say, OTUs or species uh, or sequences. Uh, and then you feed that into some other whole bunch of sets of bioinformatics tools, which I'm not going to talk about again, where you can do network analysis, co-occurrence networks, um, PCAs, multi-dimensional, uh, multivariate analyses, lots of interesting things. Um, and with metagenomics, you can also get the similar data, and as I mentioned before, you can also get these functional tables, not just about who's there, but also the different functions and their copy number in the samples. And so people will look at the frequencies of these different genes, abundances, and then make conclusions about uh, how two groups of samples are different. Um, and PyCloud basically takes the 16S data from your OTU table 
and then tries to predict using existing reference genome databases what the functions would look like. So this was published in 2013, and so I'm just going to really not go into this too detail because obviously it's a bit dated for bioinformatics, uh, but I can't resist talking about it because it's one that's still my baby and it's still pretty cool. Uh, because one it uses uh, phylogenetics, it uses like tons of more reference genomes that you have, the better it works. Um, and uh, like I said, we're putting a version. So really the idea behind PyCrust is that you have this large genome reference database. So we have tens of thousands of bacterial genomes. And for each one of those genomes, you can view it in different perspectives, but we tend to just collapse them into some sort of gene family. So in this example, I'm looking at, say, keg orthologs, but we use other functional annotations as well. Um, so you can just say how many of those are present. So you could have zero ones, but you can also have multiple versions of the same gene. So we use this large table that uh, we could get from different sources, but we tend to get it from uh, IMG right now. And then the idea simply is that if we have an OTU that maps 100% you know, to an existing reference genome, it's fairly easy to say, okay, well maybe this OTU has the exact same genome content as this OTU. That makes pretty much sense, right? Um, and if that's the case, well, if we had, say, in this example, in this first sample, if we had 10, we could just multiply 10 by those number of genes, and we would have an estimate of how many genes we might expect for that single OTU. But what gets more complicated, obviously, is if we don't have, um, if we don't have a perfect so long as if the OTU sequence is only 80% identical to something in a reference genome database, can we make some sort of prediction about what gene families may be in that genome um, and then try to scale that up? And so that's basically the sort of heart of PyCrust. So the, essentially what you have is this really large 6NS uh, reference genome tree that, uh, sorry, 6NS reference tree that has tips for all 6NS environmental sequences. And some of those tips we have genomes for. So if we zoom in, the idea is that uh, the pink labels here are just gene copy numbers for a particular gene. Um, and those are uh, tips in the tree that we actually have genomes for. And if we have those tips in the tree, then we can make predictions about the ancestral state. Um, we can make predictions about uh, what the ancestor had at different stages. So those are called ancestral state reconstruction methods, and then along with that now is there's a set of algorithms called thin state prediction methods as well. And so we've tested different methods to, to make that prediction uh, of both of the ancestral state and then to propagate that down to the tip that we don't know anything about. And then we have confidence intervals for each of those. So this is just an example for a single gene for a single tip in a tree. And so we repeat that essentially for each gene family that we're looking at, so this would be in the case of K, like 10,000 different gene families, uh, but we're also looking at EC numbers or P10s as well. Um, and so that's for a single tip in the tree. Uh, and then if for your sample, you'd have obviously multiple uh, species or OTUs or sequences in there, and we would repeat that for every one of those in your sample and combine that information together to get a, a prediction for the entire sample. Okay. And then just for validation, basically the way we did it, we just asked how well does uh, the predictions work based on samples where you would have both 16S sequencing and metagenomic sequencing. And so we predicted functions. This is on 530 HMP samples where we looked at functions by samples. Uh, and you can see clearly that there's quite distinct patterns based on body site. And then we asked how well do those functions correlate with the metagenomic sequences that we predict. And then we ask, okay, how well do those do the things align? And they align pretty well. So if we look at a, a PCA plot here, uh, these are just colored by uh, different body sites, and the lighter colors are the high press predictions, and the darker sites are the real metagenomic sequencing. Uh, and then lastly, there's lots more validations, but just to comment that maybe as expected, if you have communities of samples where we don't have this great reference genome for, then our accuracy decreases. So black, or in this case, human samples, where we have pretty good reference genomes for, you see pretty good accuracy, uh, approaching 0.9 spearmint. Uh, and then for <coughs> samples that basically have, on the x-axis here, is the distance to its nearest sequence genome, uh, weighted by the number of OTUs in the sample. Then the further we get out here, these are basically really novel samples that we don't have great representatives for, then our 
our accuracy does decrease as expected. Okay, so that was PyPress 1. So I'm not going to bore you too much with PyPress 2 updates, but basically it's more feature rich and hopefully it performs a bit better and beats out the competition. So uh, before we were tied to a particular uh, database called Green Genes, so that's no longer uh, an issue. And uh, before we were sort of looking at 97% identical OTUs, and now we can go down to 100%. So you can just submit any sequence you like. Um, and so we can map uh, both of those. Using more genomes, more genomes is always awesomer. So we <laughs> basically 10 times as many genomes. So uh, that's obviously helping our predictions. Uh, and again, we sort of made it a bit easier to try different hidden state prediction methods. Uh, it turns out that it really doesn't matter much. Uh, so we've tried parsimony, maximum life likelihood, and uh, we didn't try Bayesian. It's really slow. But everything doesn't tend to give us that much more accuracy. Um, in comparison to a few other methods that are published after PyPress 1, we're doing uh, slightly better. So PanFP, tax refund, and PyFillin. PyFillin. I say, PyPress and PyFillin. Um, so uh, you can see actually that the accuracy is not that different amongst all these things. Um, turns out that you know if you use a lot of reference genomes, you can get pretty close to as good as you're going to get. Uh, this one on the far left is just a null model. So some of you that's maybe really into bacterial genomes might be thinking, well, you know, bacterial genomes all have a core that's the same, and so that's essentially what this signal is. Where if you just pull out random genomes and and, and guess at it, uh, you actually get a pretty good accuracy here. Um, but we're, at least we're doing better than random. <laughs> and we're doing uh, a bit better than some of these other guys. Uh, and then lastly, this is really uh, in super testing mode. So <coughs> some people will, will get really scared by this, but we're sort of playing with it. Is the idea that can we predict not just 16S bacterial genomes, but possibly microbial eukaryotes from 18S marker genes? Uh, and so this is our first test looking at this. This is just not on a community level, but just at a leave one genome out approach. So you take out one genome you're trying to predict, use all the other genomes to predict it, uh, and you test the accuracy in that fashion. But we haven't tested this on an actual metagenomic community of eukaryotes, uh, mostly because we haven't found one <coughs> super great data <coughs> for validation yet. But this is in the works. OK, so I'm doing OK at the time. So I do want to shift gears to <coughs> into Crohn's disease, which is the title of my talk. Uh, and so you'll notice that these labels are pretty similar to my opening slide. For Crohn's disease, is this multifactorial disease that's contributed by uh, genetics, um, microbiome, and the environment. So there's been a lot of work on IBD, which is made up of both Crohn's disease and also colitis. Uh, and so there's been approximately 200 different SNPs that have been linked to incidence rates of Crohn's disease. Uh, and it's been estimated that about 14% of the variance uh, is explained by these SNPs, more so in pediatric uh, and less so later in life. Uh, same thing for environmental triggers, uh, obviously dietary, uh, emulsifiers, uh, fiber, saturated fat levels uh, involved in linked to uh, Crohn's disease as well. Uh, and there's been quite a bit of microbiome research on IBD uh, that's coming out all the time. Uh, and one common theme in that is basically we see this reduced diversity, so reduced number of species in Crohn's disease, uh, and that actually happens in, in a lot of different diseases. So in this study, um, our objectives were sort of to look at what's the most informative data type for predicting both Crohn's disease from controls and also um, be able to predict treatment outcome in Crohn's disease. And so what we wanted to look at was, uh, what we did look at was human genetics. We looked at SNPs from these uh, patients. We looked at 16S taxa, uh, 16S inferred functions from pie crust, shotgun data, and uh, shotgun measurement functions. So we wanted to ask which one of those was the best. We also wanted to ask within each of those what features were the most important, because that gives us some insight into the disease and the mechanism. And then three, does combining these different types of information uh, lead to a better accuracy and also a better insight into disease. So this particular study <coughs> was looking at a particular cohort uh, of patients called the Biscuit Study. So this was done in the UK. Um, and in this, we were looked at pediatric uh, kids with Crohn's disease. And these are actually biopsy samples. So these aren't stool samples, which is kind of unique as well. So we have 20, uh, 20 
uh, newly diagnosed pediatric Crohn's patients. So these samples were all taken before treatment. Uh, and then 20 healthy colon samples. I say healthy here a little bit with air quotes because these kids were actually symptomatic and were being tested for Crohn's disease, but they were classified as not having Crohn's. They would technically be possibly classified as having IBS. So they had some uh, bowel symptoms, but weren't classified as Crohn's disease. Uh, and then, we, like I said, we did this shotgun sequencing uh, of metagenomic data, and we did six nest sequencing. And since we took this from biopsy samples, no one usually does metagenomic sequencing on biopsy samples because, as I mentioned before, you basically sequence all the DNA. If it's biopsy, a lot of it's going to be human. Uh, and so uh, in our instance, about 90 95% of the DNA was human. Uh, but we put that to good use where then we called SNPs and combined them into this uh, genetic risk score that was pre-made by someone else uh, in our package for predicting uh, Crohn's disease. So we want to compare this data type to basically these different types of data from the metagenomics, just right from phylum down the stream. If you haven't taken microbiology in a while, that's uh, King Philip came over for ginger snaps, or for other, some other acronym. Um, and then also from the functional side, we looked at cake pathways, modules, and orthologs. And then from the 16S data, similar data for the, for the tax and model information, <coughs> as well as alpha diversity, so looking at the number of OTUs, uh, and then the predictions from, from high class. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, we wanted to test two major things. One, one was basically case first control, so who had Crohn's and who didn't. Um, and somewhat as expected, we sort of recapitulated what had previously been shown, so both uh, genetics as well as uh, just alpha diversity, so number of OTUs from the microbiome, showed a link to Crohn's disease. So in this case, uh, you see the difference in box plot, both these are significant. And by accuracy here, we mostly did this so that we can compare later on to machine learning methods, where we just simply set a bar across at the most optimal point to separate these two. So we get an accuracy of about 62%, 71% for the microbiome. But what's interesting is when we looked at treatment response, which I didn't mention what it was, so the treatment response has been defined here as uh, everyone gets uh, induction therapy. Uh, so first line treatment, and then if they didn't need a second round of therapy within six months, uh, then they were considered sustained remission. Uh, and if they required a second round of treatment, then they were put into the non-responders group. So this is quite a bit more informative because one, clinicians don't really care about whether I can identify who has Crohn's or who doesn't, but if we can classify who's going to respond or not respond or be problematic at baseline, then that's obviously much more informative. Um, so both the genetics and the sort of alpha diversity didn't give us any uh, significant accuracy uh, in the two, although we see a slight trend here, but they're not significant. Okay, so we, we turn to what everyone turns to in bioinformatics, doesn't they? It's machine learning, right? So um, hopefully this audience, I don't have to go over it in great detail, although I never try to go into detail anyway with clinicians. Um, but in all of this, we basically use random forest. I realize there's other methods out there, but random forest tends to do a pretty good job with microbiome data, uh, and so we, we didn't go into a great depth of looking at different things. Um, if you're not familiar with machine learning, um, the idea is we're going to give it some sort of features. In this case, uh, those are all those tables I showed you with all those boxes of different colors in the previous slide. Um, and then obviously you have this information for each patient, and then you have labels for training. So we're going to both look at disease state, whether they're Crohn's or control, and for the ones with Crohn's, we're going to look at whether they had sustained remission <coughs> or not. Um, and then for validation here, we're just looking at the one out validation, where we leave the sample out uh, and predict its accuracy. Okay, so um, what is the best for classification of Crohn's disease versus healthy? So I should mention this was published uh, just in January 2018, so uh, you can check out the papers in microbiome as well. Um, so basically, this is our accuracy. There's a few different things you can look at here. Accuracy is the y-axis. Um, and then the two different types of data we're looking at, 16S and metagenomics, and then they're divided up into here. So I'll note a few things. So first is that overall, the highest accuracy uh, at 84% was 16S data, so sort of dirt cheap at the genus level. Uh, secondary to that was sort of at the phylum level. And overall, the metagenomics data wasn't giving us a lot more uh, signal. 
The genetic risk score is this GRS, which I pointed to before, was significant, as well as the number of OTUs is alpha diversity. And I'll just point out that KO and pathways, the, the functions which we would think be pretty highly linked to a disease, weren't coming out super strong uh, in our accuracy here. So the other neat thing, as I mentioned, is that we can look at the accuracy, which performs better, but then what happens if we combine this information together? Um, so when we combine the information, you get weird things like this, where the combined accuracy was actually lower, 79% compared to the max accuracy, so it was a bit disheartening. Um, but even so, uh, you can then look at the features that are most important for classification uh, and sort of relate those to each other. So this is for predicting disease, and what we see at the top is uh, acromancia, eosinophilia, which is like the number one bug in microbiome studies. It's really a good guy. Uh, usually, if you eat too much McDonald's, you get less acromancia. Uh, in mice, if you give them acromancia, they don't gain as much weight, so they're great for obesity, but it's been linked to lots of other diseases as well. Um, and then you'll see that these are not all independent. Since we're taking the top features from each study, you see that the phylum for microbia is actually just the phylum for the same genus. So that's sort of reassuring. But what's also interesting is say number of OTs is fourth in our list here. Genetic risk score is down here, down the list. Uh, and then some of these other things have been previously associated with IBG. So the sulfavribio is here, um, and Alice types, which produces butyrate, which is really important for microbiome health, uh, is also listed there. Okay, so let's get it on to the more interesting case, is uh, <coughs> what about sustained remission? And with this, the, the outcome's a bit different. So again, we see pretty high accuracy with the genus level, still the number one accuracy uh, at 77.8%. Uh, so this is basically predicting from baseline who's gonna be responding and not. Uh, but then we do see that from the management side, we do see pathways are significant. Uh, KOs, although the accuracy is fairly low, is, is also significant. And as I already previously showed, the number of OTUs, the genetic risk score wasn't, wasn't accurate. When we combined this information, uh, unlike before, we actually did get much higher accuracy. So we got to 94%, uh, which, was, uh, which, is, which is great. Uh, and then when we looked at those features that were most important from that combined model, uh, something sort of interesting happened where now most of our top features are functionally related. So they're not just particular uh, species, they're sort of pathways that are emerging that are uh, really uh, coming up. So um, I don't think I have all these memorized, but the top one is uh, nitrotulene degradation. Nitrotulene is uh, a compound that's involved, uh, that's used in pesticides and also plastics, uh, and so it's kind of interesting that for whatever reason this pathway is coming to the top, it could be some weird environmental exposure, but it's, it's not clear at this point. Um, uh, some of the other organisms have been pre-associated again with uh, microbiome, um, and then far down the list, but it's kind of notable at least, is that virus is uncharacterized, which is not very descriptive at least. <laughs> it's showing up as a significant feature, although not that much. But enough that it sparked interest to do uh, viral studies, which I'm not going to talk about today, and see if we can characterize that side of things. Good. Okay, so I'm almost done, and I just wanted to mention, okay, so that was Crohn's disease, and so that sparked basically this idea about how to predict uh, other diseases, and if this taxa versus function thing plays out in, in other things. So we looked at a few different data sets, uh, and we're in the middle of sort of a meta-analysis, I guess. These data sets have been used probably now in, I'd say, four other fairly big papers. Uh, <coughs> most of the other papers of all, actually all the papers until one that just got published, it's a preprint two days ago, semi-scoop, oh, not too bad, I think it's all right. Uh, we're all looking at taxa, so we're just looking at different species within these. They didn't look at function at all. So this is colorectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, two different data sets, liver cirrhosis, obesity, uh, Two type two by diabetes is just women only, uh, and then this combined one is combined except where there's overlap because some of these studies were uh, had the same samples because they're done by a by MetaHit, this European group. Okay, so those are the case controls. If you're into machine learning, you'll notice that some of these are fairly balanced and some aren't, which we can talk about as well later. Okay, this is going to be a scary slide, but uh, I just went for it. 
Um, so what I want to get across here is showing you this great Curtis dissimilarity. So this is the difference between case controls and each of these diseases. Um, and so the higher you are up here, it just means the further distance you see between case and controls. And so what I'm showing here is that uh, these are all functional databases. So we have pathways, KOs, reactions are EC numbers, PFAMs, UNREF 50, UNREF 90, and then we have the taxonomic classifiers features from phylum down to species. So one thing uh, that's been talked about a lot in microbiome studies is just the fact that we see really good functional conservation across samples uh, compared to uh, species. Uh, and so that actually caused me to join course with for Doolittle at Dalhousie, they wrote this philosophy paper about basically you just can't compare those two things. They're sort of comparing apples to oranges. And also that's a bit of an artifact about what type of functional database you're using. So of course pathways are fairly high level things. They're fairly well conserved. And so you don't see actually that much change uh, across uh, cake pathways. But if you go to you know, tighter knit groupings of gene annotations like UNREF 50, which is basically just all sequences clocked at 50% identity, or UNREF 90, which is the same thing but at 90% identity, you basically get a higher resolution on the function, and then so that causes a spike up in the distances between, uh, between samples. Okay, that's all the take home is from this, except for maybe possibly some interesting things with particular disease being slightly different. So then we want to ask really, uh, we're hoping that function was going to give us much better accuracy than been previously associated than uh, taxes. And so this is for just one disease, type 2 diabetes. And we saw this nice trend where, so this is our species marker here, which is lower. Um, K pathways is doing okay. And we saw you know, 50 and 90 giving us great accuracy. So we're like, oh, this is great. You know, we're going to paper on the way. And uh, let's just do this now for the other diseases, and we'll have a take home story. And of course, the trend is not always holding true, so that's always fun. Um, so type 2 diabetes in this case again, but then when we look at the other diseases, it's not always the same trend. Um, so we thought for sure going into this, I thought for sure, excuse me, take this. But I thought for sure going into this that, you know, one of these would be the thing to look at for disease. And what we see is that accuracy depends a lot across the disease or data set, actually, is what I like to say, because if you see here, it's really independent. This is an IVD data set here. This is another IVD data set. The accuracy is tremendously different. And that just has to do with how the study is conducted, right? Which we have no control over. How people classify the patients, when were the samples taken, um, and many complications associated with it. Um, we do see fairly well that UNREF 50 and 90 are all often doing the best, but not, but not always. So, our take-home message is actually that function isn't always doing better than taxa, and that we're sort of teasing this out in more detail at this point. So this is obviously unpublished, uh, and we're still working on it. Okay, so that's it for me, basically. So hopefully I've concluded and, and shown you that there's various sequencing and biophatic technologies and challenges that exist for biophatic analysis, uh, for microbiome analysis. Um, PyCrest 2 leverages existing reference genome database and use that to infer and predict uh, possible functions from 6 s data, uh, and that machine learning can provide insight into not only just coming up with better classifiers or accuracy, but also informing some of the key features or best feature types to, uh, to look at for those diseases. Uh, future, I thought about putting lots of bullet points, but this paper just got published today, so it's kind of exciting, right? When you're traveling on a plane, you're like, yay, it finally came out. Um, so this is mine, obviously, a perspective just to those. Uh, the future, um, but not only self-promoting here, it's actually nice that uh, M-Systems put out a call to a whole bunch of new investigators, and there's a whole series of these perspectives that have been released just this month, and I encourage anyone that's looking for the future of microbiome studies, they're not too long, they're sort of 12 to 1500 words, uh, from lots of different perspectives, not just on humans, some are focused on oceans, some are fungi, uh, so I think there's something for everyone there, uh, and it's kind of fun to read through these and see where uh, different uh, new investigators are, are aiming for these. And with that, I'll just acknowledge my lab. Um, Andre basically runs the IMR, uh, and it's up to a lot of microbiome helper. Uh, Gavin is the lead author on the biscuit study, along with Casey had help. Carl was uh, leading the machine learning stuff. Um, I did this by collaborators because they're 
on the papers, but I obviously ignored all of those. And my funders, uh, so Banting was my first uh, funding, who is in the audience, thank you very much. Uh, uh, CHR through my kind of research chain, GSK has uh, given an answer about her research development grants. And I'd be happy to take any questions if there's time. <laughs>